Brethren and friends, from time immemorial it has been a custom among the fraternity of ancient free and accepted masons at the request of a brother or of his family to perform the last rites with the usual ceremonies of the craft. Conforming to this usage, we have assembled in the character of Freemasons to offer to the memory of our brother this tribute of affection. Please pray with Brother Chaplin. Unto thee, O God, Father of all, do we come in this hour of grief and grief. Unto thee do we send up the cry of our sorrowing hearts. <clears throat> Thou who dost mark the sparrows fall and number even the hairs on our heads, look with infinite compassion on our weakness, and in this hour of need give the strength which thou alone can impart. Standing by the open portals of this house, appointed for all the living, we pray for light, for light to illuminate the dark path which our brother has trod, for light to drive away all the shadows of mortality and reveal to our anxious souls those serene heights of joy and beauty, whether we trust our brother has ascended. <clears throat> As we consign his body to its resting place, may we realize how weak and impotent <coughs> is every human arm, and trust in thy might alone for deliverance from the dominion, dominion of death. Grant thy sustaining grace to these mourners and bereaved friends. May all find rest and comfort in thee, and relying upon thy infinite love, wait in patient hope for death to be swallowed up in victory. Amen. Brethren and friends, we mourn today the loss of a brother whose spirit has been summoned to the land where our fathers have gone before us. Again we behold the narrow house, appointed for all the living, and our thoughts turn to the silent realm where in that peace which the world can neither give nor take away lie the unnumbered dead. The sunshine and the storm pass over them, and they are not disturbed. Stones and lettered monuments symbolize the love of surviving friends and convey the silent admonition seek ye the narrow path and the straight gate that lead into eternal life. Again, though we, we are called upon to consider the absolute the uncertainty of death, of human life, the absolute certainty of death and the vanity of earthly ambition. Change and decay are written upon every living thing. The cradle and the coffin stand side by side, and it is a melancholy truth that as soon as we begin to live, that moment also, we begin to die. How often the reminders of mortality cross our path. The funeral bell tolls in our ears, and the mortars go about the streets. Yet, how seldom do we seriously consider our approaching end. We go on from design to design, add hope to hope, and lay out plans for the employment of many years. The messenger of death comes the least expected, and at a moment which to us seems a meridian of our existence. 
What are all the externals of human dignity? The power of wealth, or the charms of beauty, when nature has paid her just debt? View life stripped of its ornaments, and exposed in its natural weakness, and we see the vanity of all earthly things, save those which go to the growth and perfection of individual character. In the grave, all fallacies are detected. All ranks are leveled. All distinctions are done away. Here, the scepter of the prince and the staff of the beggar are side by side. Happy indeed is it for us, and blessed the ages which have made it possible that while our eyes may be dim with tears as we think of our departed brother, we may in the sincerity of our hearts accord to his memory the commendation of having lived a useful and exemplary life and is a just and upright nation. And now, my brethren, let us see to it and so regulate our lives by the plumb line of justice ever squaring our actions with a square of virtue, that when the Grand Warden of Heaven shall call for us, we may be found ready. Let us cultivate assiduously the noble tenets of our profession, brotherly love, relief, and truth. From the square, learn morality. From the level, equality. And from the plum, rectitude of life. With the trowel, thread liberally the cement of brotherly love. Circumscribed by the compasses, let us ponder well our words and actions, and let all the energies of our minds and the affections of our soul be employed in the attainment of our supreme Grand Master's approbation. Then, when our dissolution draws nigh and the cold winds of death come sighing around us, and his chill dews already glisten upon our foreheads, with joy shall we obey the summons of the Grand Warden of Heaven and go from our labors on earth to eternal refreshment in the paradise of God, where by the benefit of the path of a pure and blameless life, and an unshaken confidence in the merits of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, shall we gain ready admission into the celestial lodge of the supreme architect of the universe preside. There, placed at his right hand, he will be pleased to pronounce us just and upright nation. The lambskin, or white leather apron, was the first gift of Freemasonry to our departed brother. It is an emblem of innocence and a badge of the Freemasons. This I now deposit upon the coffin. We are reminded here of the universal dominion of death. The arm of friendship cannot interpose to prevent his coming. The wealth of the world cannot purchase his redemption. Nor will the innocence of youth or the charms of beauty change its purpose. This evergreen is, is a reminder that we have a life within us that shall survive the grave and which can never die. By it we are admonished that we also, like our brother, whose remains lie here before us, shall soon be clothed in the habiliments of death. Through our belief in the mercy of God, we may confidently hope that our souls will bloom in eternal spring. This too I deposit with our deceased brother. Brother Secretary will read the obituary roll. John Henry Rodifer was born on March 15, 1931, at Farmersville, Illinois. He was elected to receive the degrees of masonry on March 11, 1956 and was initiated on March the 13th, 1956. Passed to the degree of fellow craft on April the 5th, 1956, and raised to the sublime degree of a Master Mason, May the 4th, 1956. Brother Rodifer was a past master of the Hart Lodge number 195, and was the Lodge Secretary for many, many years. He passed to the Grand Lodge on High September 12th, 2021. The passing of our brother from the cares and troubles of this transitory existence has removed another link from the fraternal chain which binds us together. May we who survive him be more strongly bound in the ties of union and friendship. May we in the short space allotted to us here wisely and usefully employ our time. And in the interchange of kind and friendly acts, 
mutually promote the welfare and happiness of each other. Unto the earth we consign the body of our deceased brother, who trustingly leave his spirit in the hands of him who doeth all things well. With those of his immediate relatives and friends who are most heart stricken at the loss we've all sustained, we sincerely, deeply, and most affectionately sympathize. He who tempers the winds of the shorn lamb looks with infinite compassion upon the bereaved and sorrowing in the hour of their desolation. Our Heavenly Father will hold the arms of his love and protection around those who put their trust in him. Soft and safe be the earthly bed of our brother. Bright and glorious be his risings from it. Fragrant be the acacia sprig which shall flourish there. May the earliest buds of spring unfold their beauties over his resting place, and in the bright morning of the world's resurrection, may his soul spring into newness of life and expand into immortal beauty in realms beyond the skies. Until then, dear friends and brothers, until then, farewell. So the chaplain will dismiss us with prayer. Almighty God, again we implore thy blessing as we turn from this solemn service to the no less solemn duties of life. We have consigned the body of our brother to his resting place, and with unfaltering trust we commend his spirit to thy care. If we feel there is one tie less binding us to the earth, may we feel that there is another and a deathless tie binding us to heaven. And there shall be no night there, O blessed assurance. The last farewell spoken, the last sigh breathed, the last cry of anguish turned into an anthem of immortal joy. In our present grief we cling to thy promise that thou will at last wipe away all tears. Gathering here such strange experiences of thy love, catching here such glimpses of the exceeding glory that awaits us, May we feel it is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. May we keep the memory of our brother green and fragrant forever. Amen. And now, O oh God, we pray for thy hand to lead us down all the paths our feet may tread. And when the journey of life is ended, may voices of loved ones welcome us home to that house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For no discordant voice shall arise, and all the soul shall experience shall be perfect, perfect bliss, and all it shall express shall be perfect praise, and love divine and noble every heart, and hosannas exalted employ every tongue. Amen. 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 I do want to um, ask that, or remind us, should I say, we're in a day of modern technology. If your phone's not on vibrate and at this point, or you don't know if it's on vibrate, just would appreciate that um, as we honor John Henry that we don't get interrupted <laughs> with ringing phones. Um, I just know it's a reminder, I need sometimes, 
And so I just kind of want to make sure I remind everybody who would please do that. Um, I am very honored to be able to be up here today. Uh, Anna called me and talked to me about the funeral, talked to me about scripture, which I thought was wonderful to have her do that to help. I'm looking forward to the blessing of being up here today. So let's go ahead at this time and open in prayer. <coughs> Father God, you are good. We just thank you for your wonderful grace, your love, your forgiveness, your mercy, your kindness, for accepting us just as we are, as we come before you imperfect, but called to be striving toward perfection. We thank you for John Henry and his wife. We thank you for the many lives he touched and many lives that were witnessed to him through his word and deeds. We're here today to give, him, to give you glory and to rejoice in John Henry Broderford's love for you. So Lord, just um, be with me as we share through the words that he would want to be shared today. And Lord, um, we lift up Jesus. For it's in his name I pray. Amen. John Henry Rotifer, 90 of rural Dallas City, Illinois, passed away Sunday, September 12, 2021, at the Oak Lane Nursing and Rehab in Stronghurst, Illinois. He was born on March 15th of 1931 in Farmersville, Illinois, the son of John Benjamin and Claire Avis <coughs> Rotifer. On August 11th, 1967, he married Patricia Ann Johnson in Bloomington, Illinois. She preceded him in death on May 20th of 2019. John was a 1949 graduate of La Harp High School. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois. He was drafted into the U.S. Army and served two years during the Korean conflict. He worked as a teacher, as I understand, a special ed teacher, as a teacher all his life. <coughs> he also farmed in the Durham Township area all his life. He served as Durham Township Supervisor for many years. He was a member of the Laharp Masonic Lodge, the Laharp American Legion, and the Laharp Christian Church. Survivors include three children, Clark Amanda Rotifer of Ann Arbor, Michigan, Lynn and Karen Rotifer of Powell, Ohio, Anna Rotifer, of the heart. Five grandchildren, Eleanor, Derek, Lily, Silas, and Zoe. One brother, Joe, and his wife Ellen of Abington, Illinois. One sister, Anne, and John Treat of Michigan. He was preceded in death by his parents, his wife, Patricia, and one brother, Jerry Lee Rotifer. We're here today as we want to honor his life and as he wants to honor Jesus. So thank you for this opportunity and we're going to listen to the song in the garden. Please bow your heads and listen to the words of the song. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and 
the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is singing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go with the voice of woe, his voice to me is calling, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry. How do you say goodbye? Everyone comes to terms eventually with things, even with death. Sorry, I need to put my glasses on. Put it on. <laughs> How would you like to remember my father? He was quiet. He was there to listen. He was purposeful. He helped me through my problems. He mentored many young men. A lot of them sitting here today. He displayed leadership style in the infantry terms to follow me. Something about him drew you in. He didn't say much, but when he did, you wanted to listen. He was going to be important. It may not have been what you wanted to hear. It may have been thought provoking. It was purposeful. What purpose do we all have? We were all given talents from God. For those who use those talents, more blessings were given. Brother Clark and Sister Anna were not the first people in his life to recognize his purpose. We did give him his fair share of practice. <laughs> he showed us the right way, gave us room to grow, and mentored us into better people. Your God-given purpose was to display loyalty, friendship, and love. Even if he said something you did not agree with, it was all said out of love. Some of the things he said, do what is expected. Make everyone feel better. Figure it out. And mend your fences.
John's purpose was to mentor, help, and listen. He listened to gain trust and respect. He waited for his opportunity to share. When he spoke, it was with a purpose. He wanted everyone to know God. His purpose was how to display, how do you love your neighbor? Something we all need. The people's life he touched knew this. We were all on a pathway, following his footsteps, because God challenged us, and God challenged him. God blessed him, and his seed did not fall on the path or on the rock. His seed fell in the good earth, and John's blessing multiplied. He loved to challenge me to think differently. Oftentimes saying, make a new friend, offer solid advice, be there for someone. He was saying, use my talent. As I stand before you, I would like to leave you with this challenge. Follow in God's footsteps, like my father. Challenge one another to be better. Be a mentor. Be that person of trust. A lot of us here trusted John. And John trusted God's plan. Appreciate those words. They help me understand also why we wanted Acts 8 today as part of our message. Now we'll talk about John Henry. I want to start off reading the scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 through 58. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin in the law. But, thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, and knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In his book entitled Running from Reality, <coughs> Michael Green wrote these words about believers who are living in fellowship with the Lord. <coughs> you can't simply start off with Christians die well. To illustrate the point, he tells of Hermann Lang, a German Christian who was executed by the Nazis during World War II. In his cell on the night before he was killed, Lang wrote a note to his parents. He said two feelings um, occupied his mind. I am first 
he says, in a joyous mood. And second, filled with great anticipation. Then he made this beautiful affirmation. He said, in Christ I have put my faith, and precisely today, I have faith in him more firmly than ever before. Finally, he urged his parents to read the New Testament for comfort. He said, look where you will, everywhere you will find jubilation over the grace that makes us children of God. What can befall a child of God? <laughs> what should I be afraid? On the contrary, rejoice. Today's a day of rejoicing. Today's a day of celebration. John Henry's going home. But John Henry also loved all of you. And he cared about people, as we just heard, and he cared about them knowing Jesus. And he wants you to know Jesus today. I had a conversation with one of the older men in one of my Bible studies, my connect groups I do on Saturday mornings. Just a few weeks ago, this occurred. And he shared with all of us there that he's been to a lot of funerals over his years because he's up in his years, this man. He said when he dies, he wants us all to know how grateful he is for the life that God had blessed him with and for the opportunities that God had given him to serve him. He said, but he does not want his, story, his funeral to be all about stories that everyone tells about the good old guy he was. He said he wants his funeral service to glorify God and the gospel message to be shared. He said he wants his funeral to be about Jesus and the importance of everyone having a personal relationship with Jesus because he is their only hope. So after talking with Anna, I found this interesting. I reflected back just that conversation I had the week before. And her sharing that John Henry's wish for his service. And my thoughts when she did share me was, wow, I just had this conversation. But how this man that I spoke a few weeks ago and John Henry's wishes today were a lot like each other. John Henry wants you to know Jesus. And if you know Jesus, he wants you to know him better every day. And if you are here today and you have never seriously explored the word of God and have not made a personal decision in your life to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and been immersed for forgiveness of sin and received the gift of the Holy Spirit, I want to challenge you on John Henry's behalf to seriously seek someone who can help you to get to know the Word of God and love Jesus better, just as John Henry had done with others through his life. Just like we read in Acts 8, the scripture that I was asked to share. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south on the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And Philip, he arose and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join the chariot. So Philip ran to him, and he heard that he was reading the prophet Isaiah, and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? Do you know what you're reading? Do you know what, what this is saying to you? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that I was reading was like this. Like a sheep that has, like a sheep he was led to be slaughtered, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? 
for his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does this prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth. Began, beginning with the scriptures, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. They both went down to the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Hear the story. John Henry wants to be sure you've had the opportunity in your life to hear the gospel and to respond to the gospel. And when you have, to live your best for the gospel for Jesus Christ. The eunuch was reading an Old Testament passage of scripture that was talking about Jesus. Historical facts about a man named Jesus of Nazareth the Messiah, who historically we know endured the cross, who said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, who was slaughtered as the lamb, as the prophet Isaiah said, who shed his blood for you and me, so that we may accept the lordship of Jesus Christ and live a redeemed life. We receive God's grace and God's promise of eternal life with him. You see, one day, we will all die. One day, we all will stand before the throne of God. And John Henry wants you to know that as Christians, when we're faithful to him, heaven is where we belong for eternity. God is waiting for the right time for the final coming of the Lord and Savior. Christ has prepared for his family a place before the throne of God. Revelation 22 says, The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and they will reign with him forever and ever. Can you, in your greatest imagination, while you're sitting there right now, can you even imagine what it would be like standing face to face before God? I love that song, I Can Only Imagine. Because the more I try to imagine it, the more greater I expect one day that's going to be. And I can only imagine that John Henry is looking up before the throne seeing what we're only imagining. I don't know really for sure what it's be like, but I know it's going to be so great, so magnificent, that I and my limited human mind cannot conceive how splendid it's going to be. But did you know this, and I want you to hear this? This promise is only for those who know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. It's not for everyone. John Henry knew that God has given to the obedient followers of Jesus Christ his spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing one's place in the eternal home. And John Henry looked forward to going home to be with the Lord, but he always wanted to spend time with his family. You know, spend time to maybe help you guys in your decisions in life, to be there for you whenever he could be there for you, because he loved you. And he wanted to love you with the love of God. He wanted to reach out to you with God's love and a love as a father. He not only loved his family, he loved his students. He loved his co-workers. 
He loved those who worked with him. And as I've heard some some that have said, he was a great witness to them. In AD 125, a man by the name Aristarchus sent a letter to an acquaintance to give an explanation for the rapid growth of Christianity. He said this, if any righteous man among the Christians passes from this world, they rejoice and offer thanks to God. And they escort the body with songs and thanksgiving as if he was sending from one place to another place nearby. You see, believers in Jesus Christ can face death differently to those who don't know him because they have a hope beyond the grave. And I can tell you from personal experience with 17 years working as a hospice chaplain and still with hospice, I've seen many people that have died. And I can tell you I've seen many Christians that die real well because they have a hope and a promise. And they believe in that hope and that promise. And they believe in God's amazing grace. Because we're not perfect. I believe that was one of the messages that John Henry wanted to share with you here today about God's amazing grace. Because he never claimed that I know of to be perfect. Just human. He recognizes humanity and sought God's forgiveness for his sins, knowing that his God is a loving God and forgives us. But he also understood that without Christ, without God's grace, we have no hope. So listen to the words today of the song, Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet. The saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me the Lord has promised good to me, his word my hope secures, he will my shield and portion be, as long as life endures. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. God's amazing grace. Without his grace, we wouldn't have that hope that we have through faith. John Henry has gone home to be with the Lord. The John Henry that I knew through many different wrote for dinners and got to know over the last 47 years. Wow, it's been that long. We don't look any older, do we? <laughs> John Henry appeared to me as one of the more spiritual men I've known. 
And I know we could go on and on about the man, John Henry. But again, he insisted lift up the one who died for us, who gave his life for us, the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, who sacrificed his life that we can have hope. John Henry, he knew that heaven was waiting for him one day, waiting for his arrival. And he wants you to have that same confidence that he had in the historical fact about that man called Jesus, born of Mary and Joseph, an extraordinary man who claimed to be the Messiah, who the Jews had been looking for, but they denied, that he was crucified on the cross and his tomb was found empty with no clear explanation of that body and what happened to it. And of the many reports of those who had seen him after his death, wandering for those 40 days, those are all historical facts written down in books of history. The Bible just confirms all that. So as we begin to wrap things up here a little bit, family and friends, unfortunately that's why we've been given the privilege to be here today. In the flesh, prepare ourselves for adequately for the day when we too will stand before the Lord because Christ will come again. And we're here to love the Lord enough to look our best. I know John Henry would be saying you today, or at least I feel John Henry would be saying you today, that when God looks deeply into your very being, may you be found your best for God. That he would want you to be able to say with him with the scriptures, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, not only to me, but also to those who have loved, who have loved his appearing. You see, we're not here so much just to say goodbye to John Henry. No, we are, to the body he left behind. But we are here to rejoice with him in his victory. Rejoice. Well, there's no doubt there's going to be a lot of stories he's going to be missed. He's going to be missed a lot. There's going to be a lot of stories that people are going to share about him over the weeks and months to come. A lot of stories will be shared when we get done here and as we move on to the next stage and the next stage, you know, here. Lots of stories will be told, which John will be remembered by family and friends. And there's no doubt he touched the lives of many. It's good to remember. See, through those memories, we keep his image alive within us. But for those who knew... John Henry, for those he has left behind, Paul reminds you that you can have that confidence. Acts 20, 24, I consider my life worth nothing if I may only finish the race, complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. We're testifying to that today about God's grace through Jesus Christ. If you're putting your faith in Jesus, you are obedient to his word and not placing things over living a life of serving him his grace is sufficient for you you can join him John Henry one day before the throne through faith and trust in Jesus Christ and your obedience to him my confidence, my confidence is in God who says that one who has accepted him as Lord and Savior will be at home with him when our body is put aside we never know when that day is going to come. So the Lord encourages us all to be ready. I want to close with these words. Totally close with these words. Are you ready? Are you ready? When you die and God asks you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would your answer be? John Henry wants you to know. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word, for your written word. Thank you for men like Philip that could sit there and talk and explain um, the Ethiopian eunuch to help him understand about Jesus. Thank you for the lies that John Henry touched. Lies that have been changed. Lies that have been 
me better because of John Henry's faith, because of his love for your word and love for people. Lord, help us to be ones who will take the love that Jesus had and to share it with others and love others as he's loved us so we can find more peace in this world. Help us to stand strong till the end. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>